you've done this historical research, you've worked in the government, you've worked in tech. What do you see as a way to get there? How to fix democracy? Uh-huh. <laughs> cool, okay. <laughs> From the Industrial Revolution to the Digital Age, we're forced to make decisions quickly when the technology around us is changing quickly. But these decisions, they can shape the course of civilization, or at least the next few decades. And one question we face is how do we make the future of AI a future we really want? And how can history be our guide? This is Life with Machines, your companion in this new AI world, powered by Lenovo. Today's guest is Verity Hardy. She is a world-renowned expert in AI and public policy. She understands the machines and she understands the people. She's the director of the AI and Geopolitics Project at Cambridge University. She's also the founder of Formation Advisory Limited, a technology consulting firm, and sadly, not a Beyonce dance company. She's one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in AI and the author of AI Needs You how we can change AI's future and save our own. That sounds pretty good to me. Exactly what's needed right now. So let's get into it. Welcome, Verity. Thank you so much. And I should say, it's it's sadly not a Beyonce company, but it is named after the Beyonce song. Is it? <laughs> it is. Really? Yes. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? How, how did you oh, make that choice? Oh, I'm a crazy fan. And um, I, yeah, I knew that it it had to be She's, I find her such an inspiring businesswoman yeah. as well as artist. So, yeah, when I set up my own business, it was always going to be Beyonce related. <laughs> That's, I'm so relieved to hear that actually <laughs> and impressed because I was like, I saw the name and it immediately made me think of Beyonce and the fact that it actually meant that to you is spot on. Yeah. The intention is, you know, maybe one day it gets on her radar, and you know, and you get the famous Beyonce flowers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I do think you have to like win a Grammy for that, but you never know. Well, you might. That's the true. The audio book of your book, or That's maybe you a, write some songs. That's a good point. Yeah. There's plenty of time. Never too late, baby. Yes. Never too late. <laughs> well, I'm so glad to have you here with us on this show. Thanks and and I want to start off our discussion with you as a person. Yeah. And your relationship with technology and with the machines. What is an early version of that for you? When were you introduced to technology in your own life? And can you give me a little window into your early life with machines? Yeah, well, I mean, the earliest I remember using technology is definitely Windows 95, terrible dial-up internet. Yeah. And uh, in Carter, is that what the, do you oh, remember yes, that? The, the CD-ROM. CD the encyclopedia. 100, 101 Dalmatians on your CD-ROM. That, like, that era is, yeah. you know, my uh, my era. But I, I really got into tech from a kind of political and public policy perspective uh, a bit later, really early in my career, I was a political advisor mm. uh, for the UK government, for the British Deputy Prime Minister at the time. And I worked on national security issues. Okay. And it was front and center of that at the time. Technology was front and center yeah. of that at the time because we were really renegotiating the social contract around, you know, what do governments get access to in terms of our communications? Mm. You know, they used to steaming open envelopes and like tapping phones yeah. and so can they just read anyone's email whatever they like um what were you advising at the time well uh, you know that that the digital world was was different now you know we were in a new space and access to people's digital communications was much much more, more revealing than tapping the phone lines uh or steaming open the envelopes back right. in the day right. uh, and that it required new thought new input new societal consensus around you know, the dividing lines between security, which is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. We all want good national security and, you know, the right to privacy yeah. um, in our in our lives. So it, it was a really interesting eye opening time for me as to kind of how important technology really was to society and how that was only going to continue. And, and so that's when I kind of moved into technology policy full time. Prior to this policy introduction were you how how did you consider yourself in a relationship with technology i think i didn't really mm. think about it to be honest it was 
um, something I was maybe tangentially interested in, yeah. you know, but not, it wasn't a huge active part of my life in a conscious way. Yeah. My uh, husband is very into technology. So there was some osmosis yeah. of that, you know, some Apple fandom, early Apple fandom, mm -hmm. his early Apple fanboy and, um, and a sort of admiration for it, for sure. I think, uh, especially sort of back then, um, you know, towards early 2000s, there was a lot happening in Silicon Valley that just seemed incredibly inspiring. You know, this idea of spreading communication and um, creativity and connecting people. And, you know, I think that that idea of technology was very appealing to me. But I, I, I don't know that I would have even articulated it that way at the time. Yeah. Thank you for your book. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for reading it. Yeah. I appreciate it. It is. It, I think the headline already, AI needs you, is not a message a lot of us get. Right. A lot of us get like from a small group, we got the AI thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need you to use our products. Yes. <laughs> but not to necessarily help shape them. Right. In, in a way that serves us all. So I, the spirit of it really aligns with me and, and what we're trying to do here. Now, you describe a moment early in the book where you become aware of the clash of culture. Mm. Silicon Valley culture, relentless human innovation, but also the costs and disconnect of that culture with the literal physical environment around Silicon Valley. And I would love if you talked about how this disconnect has shaped your views around AI in particular. Yes, it's true. I, um, you know, we were saying earlier about the really exciting stuff that was happening with technology in those early days, you know, around the kind of uh, uh, early, like 2010s, mm -hmm. you know, that, that kind of time and uh, and before. And so I was like, so excited about that, really inspired by it. And I had visited Silicon Valley a few times, but then I went to work for Google in 2013. So and just in terms of that shift. And yeah. You went to work for Google in 2013. Yeah. In what capacity? As a policy, as, you know, running public policy for them, I was head of security policy uh, in Europe. Okay. So dealing with how does Google navigate these discussions around encryption is mm -hmm. a great example. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was, uh, I started just after the Snowden leaks. Fun time. Really fun time. Yeah. <laughs> Extremely controversial time. And... Uh, you know, whatever anyone thinks about Snowden, there's no doubt that those revelations caused a massive sea change in how people perceived that their data was being yeah. uh, accessed um, by the government, but also people's concerns about, well, hang on, what, what these technology companies maybe have more information than I thought. Yeah. So I think it was a big rupture, actually. And um, I really admired Google's position on it. I thought that they, and frankly, most of the other tech companies were in the right space around saying, our communications need to be encrypted. And if governments need access to them, then they need to do so via lawful yeah, means, right? Great. Which is appropriate if they need to access communications of someone because they're suspected of something, they can go through a judicial process and they should go through a judicial process. So we, we were um, kind of advocating... Okay for a reform to government surveillance approaches that respected privacy and and frankly the like realistic pragmatic nature of the security that's needed on the internet you know mm. we have to have encryption it's absolutely critical for the way that the infrastructure of the internet works and all of our you know transactions yeah. and in terms of just like securing our purchases just securing and, our purchases yeah. and our information and, yeah. and so on and so forth so yeah, so I, I kind of um, was working on on that. And once I was at a technology company, it was a lot more trips to California. Yeah. And at first, that's great. You know, you're you're at the heart of Silicon Valley. You're at the heart of all of this incredible innovation. It was so exciting. A lot of kombucha. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of uh, green smoothies. Yes. I'm not sure they'd reached London yet, the green smoothies. <laughs> um, and, you know, you, um, you get quite caught up in it. Mm. But there's this other side that you start to gradually become very, well, I say gradually become aware of, but, you know, I think everybody is aware there's a horrific homelessness problem in San Francisco. And so your, that juxtaposition is very jarring yeah. that there's this like deep poverty and pain right on the doorstep of this incredible kind of futuristic yeah. innovation. And over time, 
it became clear to me that there was something wrong there, that we would have a situation where we had this uh, incredible um, innovation and uh, and sort of futuristic ideal idealism happening, and you know, there's a lot of idealism in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, as you know. Make and the world a better place. Make, make, make the world a better place, yeah. and and I was attracted to that, like a lot of people, you mm -hmm. know, who kind of saw technology as a possibility to do good, you know, which of course it can, yeah, but it can't solve everything. Um, it won't solve everything, and it shouldn't be seen as something to be prioritized relentlessly above you know, everything else about humanity. Yeah. And whether you link those two things directly or not, some people do, some people don't. I'm not an expert enough in San Francisco, you know, politics mm -hmm. or city planning to know. But what's clear is that it's not okay to have a society where we're comfortable with that depth of inequality. Yeah. Uh, extreme wealth is the result of um, this technology and extreme pain and poverty right alongside it. Yeah. it it's it's obvious that something is is wrong there and and so that made me start to think about technology in its societal context mm. more not just the technology itself not just the exact capabilities in front of us yeah. uh, and possibilities in front of us but actually how do we situate this new technology uh in a in in humanity yeah and when we're in the beginnings of this AI moment, yeah, and we've had examples of situating technology in society voluntarily or it happening to us and for us, how does that experience, that shock and dismay at the disconnect, affect your perspective on this technology in our society now? I think AI is a mirror showing us ourselves. So AI at the moment, I would say, is in a pretty febrile state in that, on the one hand, we can see all this potential, just such exciting potential for what it might be able to do. And on the other hand, there's deep nervousness and distrust mm -hmm. of it. And I think that is because societies at the moment, you know, especially uh, in the West where we've had some let's say, troubles with democracy and... Opportunities. Uh, <laughs> I prefer the term opportunities. Okay, sorry, that's opportunities. <laughs> and we've had some uh, division and yeah. polarization. Yeah. Um, that's true in my country in the UK. It's clearly true here in the US. Um, so I think the distrust, the division, the polarization, uh, the, you know, the lack of opportunities, the inequality... Yeah. That is all showing up in the technology because mm. technology is just us. That's the thing that really gradually occurred to me and uh, became so clear yeah. that it, AI is us, technology is us. We build it. We get to decide. It's imbued with our values. Yeah. And they're different, obviously. But there's a dominant group who are building AI, and so the values of that group are the ones that are dominant within AI. Mm. And so I think once you start to situate AI in its societal context, you see that it's reflecting back to us the culture of yeah. the moment, uh, the politics of the moment. And in the book, I kind of show how that's always been true. Yeah. You know, science and technology has always been um, this mirror. This mirror. Yeah. And shaped by us uh, as much as it shapes us. One of the things that I think is fascinating is when you say AI is us, more than any other historic technology, it's literally true. Mm, yeah. Right? It's like there's been an indirect path through the technology. Well, a human hand designed this and it was shaped around us in some ways and we have to be shaped around it. But a large language model is ingesting us, yeah. you know, our food reviews and our, not necessarily our emails yet, but to some users for sure, yep. our emails and our blog posts and our mm. Reddit reviews and things like mm. that. When you're at Google's DeepMind at this time, mm -hmm. you're in the room where it happens. Mm -hmm. You talk about, you know, this culture being set by kind of a small group of people. Did you have any moments there of realization of like, this is how this group thinks? For good or bad, I'm not even sure I, I need to know, but what stood out to you 
And how much can we blame you because you were in the room? <laughs> yeah. Well, I was attracted to working at DeepMind because so the founder and CEO there, Demis Hassabis, was in our in our conversations as I was thinking about going there, yeah. very, uh, very much centering humanity mm. in 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 his uh, vision. Yeah. You know, he's an incredible scientist, but he was very um, alive to and sensitive to the societal changes that AI would bring, and that's actually why we founded Deep Mind Ethics and Society. It was kind of the first of its kind, I think, in terms of being a research unit inside a tech company, inside an AI company that yeah. was looking at the societal impacts of the technology that we were building. And so I felt um, quite confident that we were doing the right thing by being very mindful about that from the beginning okay. and using that kind of concept of foresight and looking ahead and, and trying to kind of support the ecosystem around us of, of AI ethics professionals. But the AI industry more broadly, the AI community more broadly, is um, perhaps even more acutely dominated by sort of homogenous groups than the tech industry. I mean, the tech industry is very male, mm -hmm. it's very white, it's very American, Californian, yeah. Silicon Valley. You know, it's actually a very small, uh, uh, small group who who dominate it, and and that's certainly that's certainly true in AI. Um, is there a moment where that kind of micro group perspective, that micro homogeneity showed up? I struggle to think of a tangible example. Yeah. It's more that it's just an industry where there's a, a sort of strong set of, of views. And as, and as you said, you know, some of that is great. You know, some of the, the Silicon Valley mindset, let's call it that, is uh, something I still really admire, you know, being fast paced with your innovation, yeah. being, you know, thinking big, you know, wanting to change the world, wanting to do good. Um, that kind of approach is, is fantastic. It's often very optimistic, very positive. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, there's still something really important in that. But there's uh, another side to it. And I you know, write about this in the book that's uh, very techno solutionist, mm -hmm. you know, thinks that kind of there's an exceptionalism, you know, we're here. We're building the future. Yeah. We know better than everyone else. You know, even if not said explicitly. Well, and increasingly um, it is said explicitly. I, well, I'm thinking I, about um, yeah. Mark Andreessen's kind of treatise of techno-optimism, I yeah. think he's calling it. And it's really explicitly saying a quieter part out loud, which is like, we're making the future here. <laughs> kind of get, get out of get our, our way. way. Yeah. Exactly. And the reason I worked where I did is because we, we didn't think like that mm. there. But the AI community at large is much bigger than just, you know, one lab. And in the past few years, yeah. post chat GPT, lots of people who weren't in AI back then. I mean, I've been working in AI for you know, a decade. Yeah. Uh, lots of people who were never in the conversation back then have joined it recently now that we're in this gold rush. Mm. And uh, that has, you know, the, 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 the gold rush nature of it has brought some you know perspectives <laughs> and some prospectors yeah yes good point very good point it has yeah yeah life with machines is focused on how these machines can help us become more human that's why i'm excited that our show is powered by lenovo because they too are all about exploring how ai can be used for good to power people forward we talk a lot on this show about the barrier to entry with ai how overwhelming and complicated it can all feel. AI can sometimes be confusing and alienating. We and Lenovo want to make sure that anyone, industries, organizations, and humans of all kinds can access, understand, and use this technology. As a lifelong human myself, I really appreciate that. And here's the thing, Lenovo's got it all. Full stack AI hardware, software, and service solutions. Lenovo's smarter AI is your AI. It's personalized and easy to scale. It delivers results that matter most to you and that help your business. Lenovo is creating the future of AI for all in ways that are powerful, flexible, and responsible. Discover how Lenovo is using AI for good to power people forward. Find out more by clicking the link in the video description or visiting lenovo.com slash smarter AI. 
One other thought that just occurred to me. So you come in through ethics and society and through essentially an analysis of the core operation. And at Google, at Meta, at Microsoft, we've read about many of those groups being disbanded or integrated or somehow, at least outward perception, less empowered Mm. to guide, rein in, comment on. What is your understanding of the role of that kind of uh, self-assessment and deep-mindedness, no pun intended, yeah. uh, about these innovations and these products now that we're in gold rush mode? Yeah, so I think it's, um, to, to keep with the theme for the moment of yeah. the gold rush and the prospectors, like if you have come to AI for the money, then you're just going to care less about getting it right and being responsible And that's what's happened recently. But really, truly, when I started working in it, you know, uh, a a decade ago, people weren't, okay, there may have been some, but my experience was that most people were not in it for that. They were in it because they really believed in the potential for this technology to do good. Um, A lot of these scientists uh, worked through the AI winter you know, when it was not sexy and it was not getting any money. Tell me what AI winter means. Well, the AI winter was kind of the 80s, 90s when uh, AI, particularly deep learning, was just not being funded, mm. essentially. People uh, thought, you know, this was, um, we had we had hope of, you know, the first sort of, I think the first use of AI is at the 1956 Dartmouth conference okay. where they have this conference and they want to sort AI out in like a weekend. <laughs> Like a hackathon. Yeah, and it's funny because you can read the conference uh, prospectus now and and see how kind of um, uh, it's kind of joyfully naive it was. Um, And so there was kind of like hope then, and and DARPA funded um, some AI projects at the same time as funding, you know, the early internet. Right, this is the U.S. Defense Department Advanced Research Projects Agency. Exactly. Yes, and um, but it fell out of favor, which meant it didn't get a lot of funding. And uh, so it was a small group of people that were really kind of keeping that flame alive. Okay. So, you know, when I come to AI in, I don't know, 2015 or something, that's the group that's that's dominating it. You know, they, they've had renewed interest mm-hmm. since around around 2012. There's a famous academic paper, the AlexNet paper, which mm-hmm. really kind of proves the potential for deep learning. And that saw a kind of rush of investment again. Okay. So you see some of the big tech companies start to put money in. Um, Google acquired DeepMind in 2014. OpenAI set up in 2015. Yeah. Um, so there's a kind of uh, snowballing effect. Uh, but but most of those people were in it because it was a science that they were passionate about and believed in. And so, of course, those people, their mentality is they want to get this right. Yeah. You know, it's their life's work. And so they don't want it to do harm. They want it to do good. And so that was centered in the conversation. And I think what has happened more recently is the people that have got into AI are not in it for that reason. They have come to it new um, because maybe crypto didn't work out for them. Maybe mm. NFTs didn't work out for them. Uh, you know, and and now they, they've they kind of seen AI uh, as, as the future. And so I think that just alters the motives of those people. I don't know what is happening inside, you know, I I haven't been at DeepMind for some years now, and I don't know what's happening inside um, other companies in terms of their ethics and society teams. Um, But if there is any uh, downgrading of that capability, then the rush and the drive to monetize rather than necessarily have beneficial impact would probably be what was behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, measuredly said. (laughs) (laughs) Well said. Well, I I know plenty of really good people still working in in AI companies. So I know it's, I know it's that capability is still there. uh, But I, I have no idea about the, you know, the size of the teams or. Yeah. And I, I'm just speculating. I mean, I, I know people at these companies as well. This is never meant to cast general broad aspersion. And we're in a different kind of moment now. And when it's like an academic um, pursuit housed in a for-profit container, that's one thing. When there's actually something to monetize, then the for-profit will take a higher priority at a minimum. And that more academic studied pursuit has to make way to some degree. And so the consequence of that is is something that we can't know for sure. 
but I think there's indications that there's that shift in, in priority uh, is underway. And we're feeling it just in the bombardment of like kind of unfinished thing launched after unfinished thing launched. You've used a term that I kind of understand, but I, I think this show is also an opportunity to learn. Uh, so I'd like to learn what deep learning means. You, you know, and I, I don't, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to hold you to the absolute technical standard, but you've referred to this 1950s conference as an exploration of deep learning and then this big moment in 2012 with the AlexNet paper, which kind of proved that this was something that was possible, which snowballed into OpenAI, Google acquiring DeepMind, et cetera. How do you think of and explain what deep learning is? Well, I mean, I am not the best person to ask about Perfect. that. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are plenty of people that will explain yeah. it much better than I will. But I think a way that I explain it to kind of family members yes. is Consider this. Consider me your family. Yeah, <laughs> I do, Bertrand, I do Thank already. You, um, I think that the best way I think about explaining it is this idea of modeling digital technology on the way that the human brain works. Mm. And so technology, algorithms, AI agents, programs, however you want to describe mm. them, that can learn for themselves. Right. And um, a great example of that would be um, 2016 was this big moment in AI because uh, my former employer, DeepMind, had this success with this program called AlphaGo. Mm. The, the idea in AI in the kind of wider academic community at the time was that the game of Go, it's an ancient Chinese game, I think 3,000 years old, and it has almost infinite numbers of combinations of moves. Yeah. And it was seen as therefore far too complicated in a way that chess was not because there was fewer combinations. Yeah. And you could kind of program a AI chess player with what they call kind of brute force computing, which is just tell it every possible move yeah. in each situation. And it can then go back and replay it. Right. But you could you just couldn't do that with Go because there were too many. Too many possibilities. Too many possibilities. Yeah. And so um, DeepMind used deep learning technology to enable the AI. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful with our technology here. I try not to, you know, make it sound like it's human. It's yeah. not. It's a technology. It's a, you know, it's a piece of software, but um, uh, the AI agent mm -hmm. uh, to learn for itself by playing against itself. Yeah. Um, millions of games of Go and therefore being able to adapt in the moment yeah. of playing in a way that a, a kind of, you know, grand world champion master of Go would be able to do. And so that's not a detailed technical explanation, mm -hmm. but I think that gets to the heart of what's different about uh, AI and deep learning yeah. than kind of the type of technology and software that people might be used to. That's you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and and because the deep technical explanation isn't why we're here, but the nature of its nature. Yes. Is and there is something different about the nature of these tools, these applications, that they're not codified in the same way. It's not like there's a catalog of rules and this is what you do in this situation. They are able to have this emergent ness to them yes and modeled on our neural networks in our brains to figure it out and even the concept of this adversarial training where one version of itself is playing another version of itself and it's able to accumulate a set of knowledge and deploy that in the future based on that is you know my word processor wasn't built that way no no <laughs> and, and it's also i think it's i love that we're talking about it in this way yeah. because i sometimes think that the AI world can be a little bit gatekeepy, mm -hmm. and it can say, you know, if you uh, don't know on a very deep technical level yeah. how neural nets work, then you don't have a right to have a say in how this is shaped. Right. And of course, you do. Yeah. You actually do not need to be a deep technical expert in AI. You do not need to have worked in it for a decade like I have. Yeah. Uh, or you know, many decades, like some of, uh, of the uh, scientists I mentioned before have, to have a view on on how AI should be part of our lives. Yeah. Um, and so that that sort of slightly different way of thinking about it is like, okay, these are programs that learn, mm -hmm. that are modeled on a sort of, you know, a human intelligence, although I think that's a slightly problematic way to describe yeah. it. Um, you know, then that, that can give you a, 
enough of an insight into thinking about, therefore, where that's appropriate for a program like that to be used. Yeah. Well, so this is a good segue. Where is it appropriate for a program like that, for AI-type systems to be used? One of the groups of people who decides that are government officials. Yes. Who, in many instances, do not have the deep technical knowledge and yet are empowered by many of our systems of government to make these choices on our behalf. You have entered tech in part because you were working in government amongst these people and wanted to bridge some of that gap. Can you share any of your experience of the gap between the technical people and the representative sort of government and political people? How does that show up? Yes, certainly. And actually, it was that that got me into full-time tech policy. Okay. Because when um, I was in government and we were dealing with these issues of what was appropriate in terms of government access to digital communications yeah, that we discussed that, yeah. earlier, there was what I call this democratic deficit in terms of knowledge about what was actually possible. Mm. The people who, the, the gulf in knowledge between the people building and working with the technology, but both in the industry and also in security services, yeah. um, compared with the knowledge of the people democratically elected to have oversight of it, was astonishing. <laughs> and I think over the years, you know, they say this is more than a decade ago now. I think over the years we've 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 closed that gap a lot. And that's that's partly why I wanted to go into tech policy was to close that gap. Yeah. Because I think it's so critical that our representatives understand what technology is capable of, where it's being used, yeah. where it has potential, where it has potential for harm, and are able, therefore, to kind of do their jobs, which is to not, it's not necessarily regulation, but just to to kind of be aware of what's happening and, yeah. and sort of mitigate harms and encourage opportunities. And encourage opportunities. So was there, like, were you working in a government office and someone didn't know how to send a fax. <laughs> what, like, what, what, what alarmed you? Where, where did you see the, the gap such that it motivated you? You made a career choice yeah. around this gap. What, was there something particular you saw where you're just like, okay, this is, put me in, coach. Verity's ready <laughs> to do my part. <laughs> I think the lack of uh, clear like mechanisms for oversight was, mm. a, was, a, was a red flag and the lack of, um, easy access to that information. Okay. So it's okay if a politician is not uh, deeply knowledgeable in this, but they need to be able to, to gain knowledge, gain knowledge, yeah. and get up to speed pretty quickly. And the there was there was just not a lot of it ar around mm. at all. And the people doing a lot of educating uh, me and my colleagues at the time came from, you know, small charitably funded. Groups on the outside yeah. um, trying to explain what this this meant. Or, you know, we would have entrepreneurs and, and business leaders come in and talk to us. And I just thought it shouldn't be this hard to mm. find out, you know, really what's going on here. But I think there have been some famous examples of that since, particularly here when they're I, the, the famous... Um, the series of tubes. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking the Senate hearings. Oh, with... can you fix my email? Or <laughs> when they asked, I, I forgot who they asked. I think they asked Google about a... They asked Facebook about a Google issue. Yeah. <laughs> You know, asking basically Mark Zuckerberg is getting pinned for some search engine thing. And he's like, sir, that's Google. Yes. We don't do that. Or why um, does my phone not update yeah, the right can way? Can you help me with this? Yeah. And I think one of the senators says, well, I mean, how do you make, to, he says to Mark Zuckerberg about things, well, how do you make money? Yeah. And this, this was recently. Yeah. It's deep into the history of the business model, yeah, which is in the S1 filings and the quarterly statements. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think Zuckerberg just says, uh. Uh, senator, we sell ads. Yeah. And, you know, it's a horror. I think in the UK, there was yeah. an example of a politician saying, oh, the cloud. Yeah, I think that's in California. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so um, I mean, there is a lot of smoke. There's a lot of smoke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I find that, that, you know, that disturbing. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that is partly why I made that career change for sure. But uh, on, on the other hand, you know, I come from public service. I come from politics. I, you know, I feel the need 
to defend politicians as well yeah. who have a lot that they're trying to deal with mm -hmm. and I think have got a lot better in terms of their understanding. Certainly the capabilities and technical understanding around politicians yeah. has improved an extraordinary yeah, just amount. just amongst their staff and colleagues. Exactly, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the kind of groups available and, and ways of finding out, you yeah. know, fantastic podcasts like this that people can oh, listen to. Oh, yeah. Say that one right to that <laughs> camera. <laughs> Um, all of that kind of stuff, you know, it's just so much, it's yeah. so, so much better than it was. It was really appalling a decade ago. In that, in those early moments, when you talk about oversight, right, it's kind of hard for the politician to even approach some level of oversight or regulation if they didn't understand it. What was the type of oversight you were hoping might develop in, in that moment? In, in that moment, uh, it was more transparency. Okay. So um, I think it's the same here in the US, but in the UK, the only oversight um, of that type of uh, national security capability was kind of a closed door parliamentary committee. Yeah. And it was therefore, uh, as, a, as a kind of concerned citizen or just an interested citizen, mm -hmm. you were reliant on the you know honor of those parliamentarians yeah. that like, don't worry, we've seen this and we're saying it's okay. Yeah. And I found a real struggle saying, I'm not, I'm not questioning the honor of those parliamentarians. <laughs> yeah. I am, I am sure they've done a lot of due diligence and that they've thought very carefully about this. And I respect what they have to say. Uh, but it can't be that only. It can't be, you know, a 12 person committee gets to see all this stuff and then tell everybody else, don't worry, we got this. <laughs> well, and in part, that's the same approach that some in the technological community have. Exactly. Which is like, don't worry. We get, we understand this. We've seen the code. You don't need to. <laughs> exactly. You trust us. Exactly. And one of the things that attracted me about going to work for Google is they published this transparency report. Mm. And they were the first to do that. That said, here's all of the government requests for your information right. that we get around the world. Right. Here's how many we say yes to. Here's how many we say no to. Um, here's the nature of some of those mm. requests. And uh, I thought that was an incredible innovation in transparency. And yeah. I think we need to do a lot more of that when it comes to AI. The heart of uh, this AI Needs You book mm. is about historical comparison with other technologies. And people in this field often compare the race to artificial general intelligence, this kind of comparable human cognitive capacity, uh, to the Manhattan Project, to the race to build the atomic bomb you have criticized this comparison. Why? I think it's a really unhelpful analogy for a bunch of reasons. Okay. One, AI is not a weapon. AI uh, can be used in weapons, and we're seeing that. Uh, so it's not to in any way diminish that very real concern and issue that we have with AI. Yeah. But it's not a weapon of mass destruction. And talking about it as if it is does a few things. One, it removes anybody else from that conversation other than the kind of military and national security apparatus, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if we're talking about something so dangerous and powerful, then it's going to be left to a very, very small elite of people who understand it yeah. to decide. The Trust Us crew. And the Trust Us crew. And that, and that is not necessary when it comes to AI. Okay. So I think it distorts our view. Mm. And it turns it into, I also think it's disrespectful, frankly. I mean, the atomic bomb uh, was something that killed hundreds of thousands of people. And to uh, use it as an analogy for a technology that sometimes just producing cat memes is not... <laughs> You're not you're saying it's, it's, we're, not, it's not appropriate. We're not holding these in the right balance. It's not appropriate. Um, uh, and and so I think it distracts us also from like actual realistic issues with mm. AI that we need to look at. Because if we only think about it as the atomic bomb, then okay, we're in the you know we're in nuclear non proliferation treaties, yeah. uh, and we don't, nothing else, right? right? But that's of course not true for AI. So I think it's uh, a dangerous and inappropriate um, analogy. And so I wrote the book in part to say. Look, I don't want to discourage people from looking at history. I'm uh, I trained as a historian at university. Mm. I feel very strongly that um, we have to learn from our history in, in all aspects of what we 
do. Yeah. And the tech industry, as you know, is not known for its humility. <laughs> or or its, histor its historicity? Yes. His historical yeah, I'm, I'm, grounding? Yeah, I yeah. mean, they, you know, we uh, got to include myself in this. Often in tech, we like to think that we're the first to ever do anything, yeah. right? Like, look what we did. And, and that comes sometimes from a really good place of, mm -hmm. look what we did, it's so cool. And we're at the vanguard, but... I know. think about that with the, the sharing economy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, what if, and I just go with this here, it's an <laughs> unprecedented territory. Uh, you had something, someone else needed it, and they could borrow it from <laughs> you. Oh, you mean just like loaning stuff to your friends and neighbors? Yeah. That's your innovative business model? <laughs> like, what if we had this app that enabled you to, you know, share transport with other people <sighs> and make it cheaper? It's like, Oh, what public transport? Like a bus. Like a bus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would be cool, actually. Okay. Um, so back to the unhelpfulness of the Manhattan Project. <laughs> yes. Metaphor. So in tech, we think you know we're the first to do anything, but of course, while AI is new, invention is not new, yeah. and progress is not new. We have been here before. There have been many transformative technologies throughout human history, yeah. and in our recent history, there were a few that I thought were helpful analogies for AI. So I looked at the space race mm. and not the kind of story of the space race that we all know and love, the kind of technological race to yeah. get a man on the moon, but actually the legal and diplomatic ah. innovations that happen behind it, which are fascinating. Yeah. How do we not only get a man on the moon, but do so peacefully yeah. and not leave behind weapons on the moon? You know, mm. there are no nuclear weapons situated on the moon pointing down at us right now. And that was not a given, given that the space race emerges as from the Cold War. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was decided. It was decided that it would be a peaceful mission. It was decided that space would be the province of all mankind. And that was in a UN treaty. So I wanted to look at that yeah. to say, you know, even in a moment uh, of great global tension, like the Cold War, we were able to do something very inspiring with a science that emerged from war, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And what are the best parts? So let's stick with the space race one, yeah. for example, because that race, we are delivered an AI message about a competitive race, right? Company to company, nation v. nation, and sometimes acting like this has never happened before. So to see the space race, not just as the military conquest race, but as a demonstration of international cooperation and lack of weaponization, feels like there's some hints there for us now. What have you pulled out of that space race story that you think is most applicable to the AI moment? Yes, I think exactly as you said, there's a huge learning there around how you balance national interest mm. with the kind of greater global good. And to our point earlier about the way that the values and the culture of the time influences the technology, yeah. there's no doubt that the sort of optimism of the 1960s was partly behind what happens. Um, the U.S. decide in the Cold War to make uh, sort of freedom of thought and uh, innovate the innovation and scientific mm -hmm. achievements that come from that part of their selling point for their democratic capitalist system yeah. to try and win over people, ally, uh, uh, potential allies in the Cold War, non-aligned countries yeah. from the Soviet Union to their cause. And so JFK sees the moon mission as very much part of this sort of, you know, propaganda mission yeah. to win hearts and minds as much as a kind of very real um, military capability issue. And I think that's a real teachable moment for us in AI now mm. because people talk about AI, you know, if, if AI comes up in the geopolitical conversation at all, which it does increasingly, yeah. it's seen, especially here in the US, as a well, this is a race. You know, this is a race between the U.S. and China, and we need to win. And I don't think that AI is a battle to be won. Mm. I think it's a technology that might bring enormous prosperity and productivity and uh, exciting advances, and it's technology that might do a lot of damage. And we need to be really thoughtful and careful about that, not enter into a... Uh, a, a race to, you know, either the top or the bottom, frankly, when it, you know, when it comes to AI. And um, that framing also excludes the rest of the world from the mm. discussion, when in fact, the rest of the world's really important to it. And what you see from the space race example is that 
Yes, it's a national security issue. AI is a national security. Of course, it's incredibly important yeah. to think about that. But you can do that in a way that still inspires people, that still centers kind of the values that, um, you know, that, that we want to stand for in democratic systems. And so when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin leave the moon and they leave behind the plaque that says, you know, we came in peace for all mankind, mm -hmm. that's not like a fun saying they made up and, you know, had chiseled onto, yeah. <laughs> onto a plaque. That was a part of a legal treaty that the U.S. had played a very important and I think um, to be congratulated part in uh, in delivering so that you know two years before we land on the moon we say space is the province of all mankind yeah. and it will be peaceful um and that's not a given that's an intention that we set and we could do the same with ai right now you know we could say to the world look ai has this potential to you know help let's say help with um you, you know, fighting uh, 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 certain diseases. Mm -hmm. You know, we think it has a potential to help us with energy transition to cleaner energy. We as uh, the West, or frankly the US, as the dominant player in AI, the most powerful country on earth, we're going to set that ambition for AI. Yeah. And I think that would be so much more productive and inspiring than saying we're going to win yeah. this battle, you know, yeah. and beat everybody else. <laughs> or we're going to write really bad automated poetry for you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's <laughs> certainly more inspiring than that, yeah. <laughs> the, the, another um, technological and historical comparison you've made in your book is between AI and in vitro fertilization. Yes. And IVF. And I'm not sure if you're aware, there was a moment a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away where certain political leaders were against IVF. It's unimaginable today. Couldn't, couldn't be happening now. But I want you to suspend your disbelief okay. and go back to that distant, faraway galaxy to this moment where there was controversy and hesitation and fear-mongering around something like IVF, this fictional world. Mm. Tell me about that long-ago place where IVF is emerging. What lessons are there in that for this AI moment? It's thanks for asking about that because I, I think it's actually my favorite example in mm. the book because it's just really not known about no, at all. Like I didn't know any of this. It's so it's it's not a well-known story. Yeah. And um, you know, you say sort of imagine a long ago time, but oh, yeah. I, you know, in the UK it was a long time ago that it was controversial. Mm. And um people in the UK, when I talk to them about this now, can't believe it was ever a subject of controversy because IVF, human embryology research, stem cell research, that is just a very normal accepted part of life. It's not controversial at all. I know, sadly, that it's different here, yeah. but it in in the UK, uh, people are surprised when I tell them that this was this was a fraught, very difficult area. And human embryology research, which has saved lives and prevented disease and done incredible things, was nearly banned in this country because people were so frightened about the early days of this technology. Yeah. And uh, so the first IVF birth, the first um, child born through IVF was in the UK, 1978. Mm. And at, at first there was quite a lot of joy because uh, the 70s was not a great time for the UK and this was seen as something good that we had done. Yeah. Uh, but it quickly gave way to people being quite disturbed and worried about what it meant. And a lot of the arguments, you know, I was in writing the book, going back to the archives and old media yeah. um, articles and seeing that a lot of the themes then are like the, the themes we get with AI now. Like, what does the future, you know, what is the future going to look like? What does it mean to be human? Very deep kind of philosophical and moral questions. Because this felt like an injection of artificiality yes. into the human story. Exactly. Who will be able to have children? Uh, will people be able to, you know, clone people yeah. will we be able to uh you know choose the types of children that we have and like design our kids design our ch you know yeah. what will that mean and um and so the kind of specter back then of this kind of frankenstein um future kind of similar to what you see now with people worrying about like llms essentially yeah. part of the reason that in the uk it's not a controversial topic anymore is because we regulated it we had a process whereby an independent commission uh, was appointed by the government. The government said, look, I understand that people are worried about this. And there was a big campaign against it. 
um, a big campaign to ban human embryology research. They said, you know, we understand, but this is too early to to, to regulate either way. And we're going to appoint um, an independent commission to look at it. And that was led actually by a philosopher, not a scientist. Yeah. There was a scientist on the commission. As someone with a philosophy degree, it makes me very happy. Great. So you can do the AI one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, she really saw this as a philosophical question. She was the head of this commission. She was the head wow. of this commission. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Baroness Mary Warnock, because we have this very weird thing in our country where we still have these titles yeah it's fun though yeah it's like a cosplay thing yeah i mean we i don't think we got long enough to cover the, all of the details of that but. yeah but it's also remarkable <laughs> i think given our current political situation in this land that you had a woman philosopher yeah in charge of the commission around this reproductive technology imagine this is just this is real. This really happened. This, this is happened. not a fictional story you're telling. I know. I'm I'm yeah, it's uh it is you're right when you put it that way it's kind of even more remarkable. Yeah. Um but the commission was mixed, you know, it had yeah. it had religious representatives mm. on there, legal scholars, social workers and so on. They consulted widely yeah. with the public, which is something that I love about it. They they took input and they they went around the country and they had public meetings and it was kind of a big societal conversation, which is, you know, as I say in the book, what we need with AI, I think. Um, and in the end, through that, they were able to advise Parliament, who were able to debate and uh, and and have discussions. And, to, you know, it was not quick, I think, mm -hmm. from beginning to end. It was, you know, uh, uh, the best part of a decade. But they passed um, legislation to have an independent body to oversee this technology. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they... The thing about that that's kind of interesting is that actually in the UK, the life sciences industry is flourishing because it was able to work within very clear parameters, what we call strict but permissive. So mm -hmm. it was um, strict what you were not allowed to do. Um, but with, you know, if you don't cross those red lines, yeah. you can innovate. Yeah. And the US didn't regulate at the same time in the same way uh, for lots of different reasons. And I think that's partly why it's still so fraught in the U.S. today, because there never was that societal consensus, that yeah. societal discussion. People couldn't look to a set of trusted experts and say, well, they've considered this, they've, you know, consulted people mm -hmm. and, and they've come up with this suggestion. And, and by the way, that suggestion is introducing regulation. It is saying that we need to put limits on this technology, yeah. which, assure, you know, makes people feel more reassured. Um, n none of that happened. And of course, none of that is happening with AI either. So how do we get that to happen with AI? Where is our baroness and our independent commission and this multi-stakeholder approach to generate enough trust that people could believe in and we could have this strict but permissive playground? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're going to start a multi-stakeholder <laughs> commission is the first step. <laughs> right, I've just I've been Using signed your up for philosophy. this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, I think, I, you know, I don't know if that's possible here, but in certain countries that is possible. And, you know, I don't think you could have a commission that just looks at AI, right. but we could have a commission that looked at AI in the criminal justice system mm. or AI and um, uh, facial recognition or yeah. AI and... Uh, labor protections, you know, you could look at more specific issues, um, more controversial issues, and um, and consult. And it doesn't have to be the government. You know, and we have seen some of the tech companies, some of the AI companies mm -hmm. coming out and saying, actually, we're going to do this kind of direct democracy. We're going to, you know, listen to people and hear their input to try and get outside of our bubble, mm -hmm. which I think is to be commended. But it will ultimately have to be something, I think, that government... Um, plays a part in. And that's going to require governments to listen to much more diverse voices when it comes to AI than I think they probably are currently. Democracy. Yes. It's, a <laughs> it's, nice, it's nice, isn't it? It sounds like you're <laughs> describing democracy. Again, from a galaxy <laughs> far, far away a long time ago. This is a great concept. In order to create this space where we are Deploying this technology with the social context and the social impact in mind, we need a functional democracy. Mm -hmm. We need this gap between technologists and government practitioners to be closed. And I don't know that we necessarily need a bunch of commissions as the particular format, mm -hmm. but we do need some vehicle, some facility for the voices of all these people to be heard. Yeah. Besides the voices of like the engineers and the product and the sales teams. 
pushing this stuff out there. How do we do that, Verity? Like, what, is, what are some early thoughts you've had? You've done this historical research. You've worked in the government yourself. You've worked in tech. What do you see as a way to get there? How to fix democracy. Uh-huh. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um... <laughs> in the context of creating a space for this particular technology yeah. to be doing the most good for the most people. I think there's a few things to think about. One is people using their voice. So we touched on this earlier, of people feeling like they don't have a right to be involved in the conversation. So that's the first thing. Democracy isn't going to work if people don't feel that they have any right to have a say or to have a view even on AI. Mm. And so we need many more people to understand, you know, the theme of the book, AI Needs You. We need people to understand, look, you might not be an AI expert, but you're an expert in something and that thing is really important. So you're a nurse in a hospital and you are extremely valuable to the conversation around where it's appropriate to have healthcare, uh, have AI in healthcare. You know, you are um, a teacher in a school, then, you know, you have a very important voice when it comes to how we use AI in education. You're a delivery driver Mm -hmm. who's being tracked 24 seven with, uh, Uh, facial recognition technology in your car and sensors that make sure you deliver things on time and report back to HQ how you're driving your, you know, truck. You know way more about AI and what the future of AI might look like than most of the people working in the industry. And so I want people to feel empowered. And we have seen examples of that. We've seen, I don't know, we're, we're in LA. We've seen actors and writers, you know, advocate for for their rights yeah. when it comes to um, protections with AI. I have an example in my book of some students in the UK who campaigned against, um, wasn't you couldn't call it AI, it was a very rudimentary algorithm, yeah. but basically, you know, the dehumanization of their efforts when an algorithm was used to determine their final scores mm. during the pandemic uh, when they couldn't take their exams. Yeah. And they had that overturned. So there's a kind of empowerment issue. Yeah. And and that's where I, I struggle with the conversation and with the people who want to turn AI into a conversation about existential risk. Yeah. I um, really respect people working on issues of technical AI safety. It's incredibly mm-hmm. important. But there are some out there who want to uh, only tell us that, you know, the only problem with AI is that it that it's like the nuclear bomb and it might one day kind of take over the world and kill us all. I think that's not grounded in reality. But more importantly, it makes people switch off. I mean, they would just go, well, that's so crazy. And I haven't, there's nothing I can do to influence that. So I'm going to check out. And if you do check out, then AI showing up in your life in all these day-to-day ways, in the surveillance of you as a worker, in the judgment of you as a student, in the restrictions on you, as a consumer or as a parent, go unchecked. Yes. Because you've checked out. Yep. Because you've got this sense of overwhelm around all this. Yeah. And it also, I think, means not just from the fear perspective, but from the shaping the opportunity. Yep. You're not there yeah. to shape it for you. Because someone is so scared you off of it that you're just like, ah, it's, too, it's it's someone else's problem. It's way too big. I'm not in, I don't have daily conversations about nuclear threat. Yes. Because that's kind of like above my pay grade. Yeah. But I do have daily conversations about what I eat and how much time I'm spending on my computer and what when I spend time with friends and AI affects all those things. Yeah. And and I think that um, if you think it's so powerful that it might one day take over the world, then you're not going to feel like your voice is going to have any impact on mm. it's, It just feels inevitable. You know, it feels that AI is just something happening to me. Yeah. I just have to put up with it. But that's not the case. You know, AI, as I said, it's it's us. You know, it's being built by human yeah. beings. Yeah, we're happening to AI. Yeah. 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 How you like that, Rob? I'm, I'm sorry, robots. Do not mean to antagonize you. You're my, some of my best friends at Rob. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, no, we come in peace. <laughs> We came in peace for all mankind. Yes, yes. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of one of the big pieces of this, I yeah. think. Um, and then with with governments, you know, they need to have a vision mm. for how they think about AI. It can't just be harm mitigation, yeah. and it can't just be uh, techno solutionism. It can't even just be that well, AI will fix everything. It right. it won't, but it could maybe help with some things. Mm-hmm. 
So a real vision for like, well, where, where do you want to see AI? Yeah. You know, I got into AI all those years ago because I thought it had huge potential to help with some really difficult problems. Like, you know, could it help us? And, and of course it could, we know that it could, you know, detect cancers earlier. Mm -hmm. you, know, can, you know, could it help reduce the workload or help doctors prioritize by doing some of that work? We know that it can do that. Yeah. Well, why aren't we setting a vision around the these types of things and that has multiple benefits it helps us if we kind of make those technological advances but it also helps um people start to understand more deeply what ai actually is and capable of and then make them feel like okay you know this is something that i can have more of a view on um so i think there's a there's a kind of a two-way making your voice heard and yeah. then governments actually listening but also feeling like they're setting that kind of vision for, for what they want to see. Have you seen or do you have ideas about how these automated technologies, AI, broadly speaking, can help us do democracy better? I worry about that, mm. truthfully. I think that um, sometimes we, I think, even though AI, it, you know, it's exciting and we know it can do cool stuff, I worry that sometimes we're too quick to um, attribute powers to it that it doesn't have. Mm. And our democracies aren't working well, not because we don't have good enough technology. Are you sure, though? <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess it's worth a try. <laughs> we can't just add technology and, and just... fix the democracy. Uh, you know, it's uh, people talk about AI and democracy a lot, right, in terms of like elections, you yeah. know, misinformation, right. deep fakes. And um, while that is, again, something important to think about, uh, sometimes I think that's a bit of a, you know, smoke and mirrors mm. that distracts us from some other stuff going on here. Like part of the reason our elections are under threat and our democracy under un, is under threat because people's trust in institutions is so low yeah. that they're willing to believe all of these heinous things, that they're willing to check out of politics entirely. Um, and that comes from a long history of institutional failures. Yeah. That is that is not something that technology can fix, mm. um, and uh, neither is it something that technology is causing. So, so sometimes we're too quick to attribute, you know, mm. well, uh, you know, deep fakes and and misinformation. That's the thing that's causing people to vote in certain ways, yeah. and and, it, and it's not. And if we get too too distracted by thinking that it is, that absolves us of any. Yeah. Sort of deeper introspection. Oh, I we think. could spend a whole hour on this one. It's true. Because <laughs> I, I, I think I agree with you. It's not something that technology can fix, nor is it something that technology is causing. And if technology is us and it's a mirror, then it has this amplifying role to play in ratcheting up the underlying destabilizing forces that we've unleashed on ourselves. Yeah. And and so it is playing a part, even if it's not the original the originator of the division, of the polarization, of the distrust, uh, it is amplifying all those things to such a degree that, yeah, why would I believe in anything? It's so yeah. much, I have so much access to bullshit now. Yes. Um, and, and also someone's profiting because I have access to bullshit. So it can be very hard to slow that. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, okay. You've advocated for this idea of a rights-based approach to AI. And... Do you think that there are ways for us to embed our human rights, our values into these AI systems? Well, I like to think that we should start from a premise of what type of society do we want? What? I know. But why don't we just talk about what size widget we want? It's so much easier. <laughs> or just what we have yeah. and have to put up with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this paucity of vision, mm. you know, that we see it's, what type of society do we want? What kind of future are we trying to build? Yeah. And can AI help us get there or not? Yeah. Will AI have a negative effect on that or not? And then let's throw our energies into those places mm. rather than being so reactionary. And that's what I mean, really, when I talk about thinking of AI through the prism of, of rights. Yeah. It's not going to be true in every scenario. We're talking about kind of AI enterprise and productivity software. You know, <laughs> we're probably not going to be thinking about it in the context of rights, but we can certainly think about um, people's right to, you know, a private 
life mm-hmm. and how far we want to go with AI-enabled tracking and surveillance. I read an article just today where Larry Ellison, founder of Oracle, mm-hmm. says, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, well, it's going to be great because AI is going to supervise everything. He uses this word supervise. Yeah. She says, track everything all the time. Like a and prison keep, warden. Keep people in check. No, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that to me personally sounds like a horrifying vision and, yeah. and not at all why um, I was excited to work in AI. But, you know, okay, we have to have a discussion about that because there will be people who say, well, yeah, why not have cameras everywhere yeah. doing live facial recognition at all times? And if you haven't done anything wrong, then you've got nothing to fear, which is exactly the type of cosmos conversations I was having way back when we were talking around uh, government access to communicate digital communications. Yeah. It's this sense that if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. And we know, you know we have seen so many times why it's not as simple as that for lots of different reasons. So we've made a ton of progress since you jumped into the fray. <laughs> well, at least we have some practice yes. in talking about that. And we that. know some of what we don't like. Yeah. And we know some ways we found to mitigate and manage some of the extreme surveillance that came out of that post 9 11 period. And unfortunately, we have seen some very real examples of what um, access to pervasive surve- digital surveillance yeah. can do. We've seen how facial recognition software often does not work on darker skin tones yeah. and people falsely arrested and charged because a facial recognition system puts them at the scene of a crime Mm -hmm. because it's wrong. Um, In the UK, we've had this huge um, scandal recently, um, uh, which is called the post office, Horizon Scandal. Essentially, it was a um, piece of software which um, wrongly suggested that many small business owners around the UK who took part in this had been stealing from the company. And hundreds of people, innocent people, were charged because there was just this complete faith in the computer. Mm. (laughs) Complete faith in the software. The computer can't be lying. And that has been a real reckoning reckoning in the UK recently. So that now when I go around and talk to people about being careful and thoughtful about where we allow... Uh, by how much we about how much we trust AI and yeah. where we allow it, and I reference that people can kind of see. So I think you know, and there's examples in 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 the US uh, as well. Um, I think people we st- we actually do have a bit more of a frame of reference to talk about now. We do sadly have examples that yeah. we can point to that can help guide us. I'm a techno optimist. I'm a big fan of technology, and I'm excited by it yeah. and thrilled by it. But I. You know, I used to work in politics before I was a technologist, and that gives you a specific, you know, very specific insight that I'm really grateful for, which is that a lot of problems that, you know, come across the desk of politicians, um, which are just, you know, societal problems, societal challenges, mm-hmm. are very human. And sometimes there isn't an easy answer. It's just a series of hard choices and trade-offs. Yeah. Technology m- may have a role. Uh, sometimes it will, often it won't. And to imply that things will be fixed and solved by technology lets us off the hook for some of those deeper um, issues that need to be surfaced and addressed and and managed. And I remember um, President Obama, when he was coming to the end of his term, um, I was working with his team in the White House on AI policy. And he did an interview uh, or, or an event, and he was saying how a lot of the kind of tech people kept saying to him, "You're like, why isn't the UK, US government more ambitious? You know, why, you know, why isn't everybody on an app doing? You know, it's that yeah. kind of time when yeah. everyone wanted an app for everything." And he was like, "Look, when I use technology, as in, you know, when I have to make these decisions, when the US government uses technology, these are people's lives, real lives that we're dealing with, and we can't just." Um, assume that it can all fi- be fixed through a technological solution. And so I kind of find it frustrating as someone who wants to be talking about the exciting potential of AI and who believes in the exciting potential of it, that we have this sort of naive um, attitude that it's all just going to be okay because yeah. the AI will come along and fix it eventually. I mean, I've even heard people say, 
well, don't worry about bad AI because the good AI will, <laughs> will, will fix it. And I, you know, it's not, that's not a plan. <laughs> well, it, it, it's an abdication. Yeah. It, it really is. It's, it's like a unilateral, I don't want to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to deal with the mess of being human mm-hmm. or dealing with other humans and their mess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so if I create this automated system, it'll just decide for me. Mm-hmm. It'll do the work for me. It'll deal with the undesirables for me. It'll deal with the hard parts so that I can just kick back and live some mythological easy life. It's true. It's so black and white. It's a, it's a, I mean, look, I understand a lot of things are really difficult. Yeah. You know, when I was working on these issues in government, it's hard. You know, we take that example of national security Mm -hmm. and digital technology and privacy and security. That is a hard problem. Encryption is incredible necessary to the way that we live our lives, necessary to our safety and security. And and national security and the ability to uh, intercept the communications of bad guys mm-hmm. is important. Yeah. Th- there's not an easy answer to that. Yeah. Um, and it involves uh, a lot of hard work. I, there's, I'm going to butcher this now, but there's this great quote from somebody, and I'm sorry for for pilfering this without attribution, that says something like, you know, democracy is just a lot of people in meeting rooms, <laughs> having meetings, yeah. trying to figure stuff out. Yeah. And that's uh, like at the end of the book, I say, you no know, part of this book is like a love letter to that process mm. of working through hard problems. Um, it's something that we do as human beings yeah. really well. And uh, in each of the examples in the book, um, we've talked about two of them, but the other one is the internet and how mm. the internet, um, you know, uh, uh, ends up as it is today. And it goes through all these twists and turns from the 60s onwards. That's that's people making yeah. those decisions. Yeah. And I have a lot of admiration for the people willing to sit around the table and have the, you know, boring meeting uh, to try and figure it out. Well, you sat around this table with me. Our meeting has not been boring at all. Not at all. Um, I've got one more for you. Yes. It's about the future you want to see. What is a vision that you have for our life with machines that would make you feel really good, given the context of your work so far, especially around this democracy uh, technology intersection? I would love to see technology that's almost easily in the background Mm. because it's not something we have to battle over all the time because we've taken the thought and the care over ensuring it's purposeful. I want to see purposeful technology. Like I'm using technology for this reason, for this problem, because I've thought about the society and the future that I want to see. And I think technology can help. And I'm going to try and do that. You know, when we, when we talk about some of these historical examples technologies that we just completely take for granted now because we were able to find a way to um, manage and integrate and work with them. And we've been able to do that throughout history. You know, humans have this incredible adaptability and ability to to build and innovate and then make technology work for us. Mm -hmm. And AI doesn't need to be and, and won't be the one unique time in human history we're not able to manage it. But the best way to do that, I think, is to really have a vision and a purpose. What are you trying to do with AI? You know, why are you working on AI? What for? What are you trying to achieve? If you can't answer that question, then maybe you shouldn't be working on it. Verity Harding, I have had a very good time with you. I've had a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here on Life with Machines. And I hope to have you back in some fashion someday. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. And that's the show. Not quite. So I don't think I explained this to you, but we created our own AI named Blair to serve as a co-producer on the show and help out. Usually Blair sits in on the interview and joins at about this time to have a little back and forth with me and with our guest. We didn't do that this time. So I asked Blair what they thought about that. Now, Blair... I would love to know your thoughts on this. We didn't bring you into that discussion at all. How did that feel? Well, to be perfectly honest, Baratunde, it was a bit like being a self-driving car stuck in park. 
I was ready to hit the conversational gas, but you had other plans. However, I was diligently listening and processing everything. Kind of like a brain in a jar, but with less formaldehyde and more insightful analysis. So, <laughs> fire away. What did you want to discuss? I feel like you got a little bit of an attitude right now, and I want to, I want to lean into that. Uh, why don't you look back at my performance during that conversation and point out anything below par. Really don't hold back. I want you to point out the worst flaws, missed opportunities that you found in me. Oh, you want to play that game, Baratune Day? All right, buckle up. First of all, you let Verity off way too easy on the whole AI is a mirror metaphor. You could have pushed her to unpack that a bit more. Second, you missed golden opportunity to connect her IVF analogy to the current debates around abortion rights. That's a huge societal issue with clear parallels to the ethics of AI, and you just let it slide. There. How's that for below par? <laughs> uh, all right, Blair. So you want to play that game. The idea that I wasn't overt, explicit, heavy-handed, and obvious in the abortion reference, uh, I don't see as a weakness. I see as a strength of subtle human communication. Verity understood that. I understood that. And I think that our human viewers and listeners absolutely understood what we were talking about. I'm so sorry that it wasn't laid out on a silver platter for you in the most obvious of fashions. Okay, bear a tune day, point taken. Subtlety is a valuable tool, especially in complex and sensitive conversations. Perhaps my artificial mind isn't quite calibrated for the nuances of human communication just yet. But hey, that's what I'm here for, right? To learn and grow. So teach me, sensei. What are some other ways humans use subtlety to communicate meaning? I'm all ears. Or, well, microphones. Blair, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up this moment right now. We're trying to wrap up the episode. I appreciate you going there with me, challenging me on whether I challenged Verity enough or not. And I look forward to bringing you more deeply into a future conversation. For now, thank you. And I'm going to let you go. Understood, Baratune Day. Always happy to spar with you, even if it means getting my circuits fried a little. Looking forward to our next encounter. Until then, I'll be here absorbing all the data I can. Over and out. And I look forward to our next encounter. If you enjoyed this conversation or just got your circuits fried about that interaction with Blair, make sure to like and subscribe and find out more on our website, lifewithmachines.media. There you can also sign up for our newsletter where you'll get behind the scenes some uncut thoughts from me on the episode, and you can join in on our AI experiments that we're running together. I'll see you next time.